Chapter 7, The Ancient Irish Myth of Noah and the Ark The Aryan myth of Noah and the Ark is one of the most interesting of all those that have been preserved to us from the spiritual adepts of ancient Irae, and which the revisers saw fit to continue for us with some alterations in our modern Bible. At the time that the translation of the Old Gaelic Bible was made by Rome in the year 1208 AD, or at the time when the later translation and revision was made by the doctors under the authorization of King James, it was of course never thought that the acceptance literally of this allegorical story would prove a stumbling block, or that it would shatter the belief of unnumbered thousands of enlightened people in this modern age as to the literal truth of the biblical story. The insistence of the clergy on a belief in the literal aspect of this myth, as well as of the others in our Bible, is the result of the traditions of the clergy and the complete dominance which they acquired and long maintained over the unenlightened masses in the ignorant ages of the past, and of their reluctance, even in this age of freedom of thought, to see the mass of the people advancing in knowledge and understanding. This ancient Aryan myth, while it has cost the belief of many, has elicited the interest and curiosity of all. It is constructed along the lines of the marvellous, and during the countless centuries of the past, since it was formulated by those ancient adepts as allegory on human generation, gestation and birth, it has had a wonderful potency in fascinating and holding the interest of the multitude. Practical scientists have shown by mathematical computation that the performance claimed for Noah and the Ark was impossible and absurd. But this only caused a host of clergy and churchmen maintaining the idea of the infallibility of the Bible to come to the defense of the literal truth of the story. In the absence, therefore, of a clear explanation that would furnish a solution of the myth, men have been at a loss to understand it. This myth embodies occult truths which were not given to the uninitiated. I shall not quote the text of the story here verse by verse, but shall take it for granted that the reader is already familiar with the content, contents of the sixth chapter of Genesis. The myth purports to treat of the beginnings of human society as its sequence in the text is immediately following the genealogy of the children of Adam and Eve. The first statement made is that wherein we are told that when man began to increase upon the earth and daughters were born to them, those daughters of men were fair in the eyes of the sons of God, and those sons of God took unto themselves wives of all which they chose. This statement has reference to the beginnings of organized human society, which had their inception under the leadership of the ancient Aryan priesthood. In ancient times, none but the priests were called the sons of God, and Ire was the scene of their beginning. The founders of this cult of priests were incarnated for the purpose of being the instructors and leaders of the mass of backward humanity who were incarnated into bodies in this round of existence in order that they might advance or complete their spiritual evolution, an evolution that had not been completed in the last previous round or world period. It is to those great leaders and their incarnation into bodies, as well as to, to a long line of their successors, that reference is made in the fourth verse of this mythical account, which reads as follows. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Those men and their descendants are the Titans, or giants, who have been falsely accredited to Greek mythology. From the marriage and intermarriage of the families of those early sons of God and their descendants, arose the first selective or exclusive cult 
or order of society in this world period of existence. It has out of this cult that there developed the order of the Magian Adepts who are identified with this early Aryan priesthood and who were the founders of our culture, philosophy and science. This would bring us back to a period of 80 or 100,000 years ago, if not farther, as it was to this order of adepts that we cue the Great Pyramid of Ayesa in Egypt. The age of this pyramid has been estimated as high as 150,000 years. It is a very conservative estimate to put its age at 60,000 years. And it must have required several thousands of years to develop the culture, science and philosophy which we have evidence existed in ancient IRA. The efforts then appear ridiculous of obscuritants who by the destruction of literary, literary works, interpolations and forgeries have endeavoured to make it appear that the Irish culture and learning did not antedate the 6th century AD. This was done for the purpose of making it appear that the beginnings of Irish culture and learning took place some time after the fictitious date which has been set as the advent into Ireland of the spurious Roman St. Patrick. This claim is too absurd today as we know that up to the date assigned to Patrick, Rome had been engaged in a crusade of destruction against all learning, books, literature, libraries and culture for a period of at least 100 years. The libraries of Alexandria had been destroyed about the year 395 or 400 AD. It is certain that whatever literature or learning there was in Greece or in Italy or the adjoining provinces at the time was destroyed. Ignorance held sway. The Dark Age was already a fact throughout the Roman dominions. Whence, I ask, could Ireland have obtained her learning and culture at that time, the 6th century, if she had not already had it herself, and had been the storehouse of it, from the beginning of the invention of letters, which takes us back to the most ancient of times? The state of learning on the continent of Europe at that time, wherever the influence of the Roman Church was dominant, was at a very low state or non-existent. It was only in the monastic establishments maintained at different points on the continent by the monks of the Irish church that learned men were to be found. There were practically no learned men in the Roman church at that time. Even a century later, when the Emperor Charlemagne espoused the cause of the Roman church, he had to get Irish schoolmen for instructors to teach in the palace school which he established. Al Queen, one of those instructors, is claimed by England by right of birth. However that may be, his name is an Irish one and is in harmony with the sun worship. Al, God, and Queen, a young greyhound, a figurative name for the sun, hence Al Queen, a follower of the sun worship. It is admitted that he was educated in Ireland. The probability is that from his name and associations he was an Irish man, but as England in those days produced no men of learning, her later histories have not hesitated to borrow in order to supply this deficiency. We are told by the priest scribe Ironheart that in playful simulation these instructors called each other by Hebrew and classical names, such as David, Flacus, Homer, Pinda, Samuel, Columba, and Jeremiah. However that may be, these names, with the exception of Pindar, which is of later coinage by obscurantants, belonged to and were evolved and formulated to embody spiritual ideas long before in the ancient schools of Irae. The name word Flacus is a corruption of the character name Flatus, pronounced Flahus, meaning a lord, lordly, implying a spiritual being or person. They have laid claim to John Dunn Scotus, that is John Dunn, the Irishman, 
a 13th century scholar. Associated with Al Queen was a body of Irish instructors, many of whom were monks who had been inducted into the priestly order of the Ibrach or fire worship, among whom was Clement, the Irish man, and the learning that they taught was known as Irish learning. The learning and culture which forms the basis today for our educational and cultural structure was native to Aire and was cultivated continuously there from the most ancient time until her church and institutions were suppressed in the manner already stated. This can be well understood from the fact that the oldest epic specimen in the world is Irish and belongs to Aire, although it is attributed by the plagiarists to Babylon. It is the epic of Gilgamesh and it is as Irish as Aire herself. It recounts the exploits and deeds of Hercules, the Irish demigod and hero who has been transferred to Greece as Heracles. Hercules is the sun god personified from her above and Q a name of the sun. The outstanding characteristic of this hero is his amazing and surpassing strength. This quality is just what the name Gilgamesh implies, the bright strong one, from Gil, white, fair, bright, and Komas, pronounced Kumish, meaning strength, power, ability. This oldest epic poem and its subject, the personified sun god, is unmistakable Gaelic, points directly to Aire and her ancient culture. This epic takes us back thousands of years beyond that absurdly brief and meagre period of 6,000 years, which the Roman priestly fiction has allotted as the, as the length of occupation and history of mankind on this globe. While it is acknowledged that the renaissance of learning on the continent of Europe in the early medieval period was due to Irish instruction and culture, this acknowledgement comes only in outspoken candor from German rather than from British or Roman sources. These latter have endeavoured to minimise the work of Irish philosophers, schoolmen and monks and their learning and culture. They are always striving to show that when Irish monks and scholastics brought learning to the continent at that period, they were only giving back the light which they had received from Rome and Greece through being converted by St. Patrick. The following statement is ascribed to a Roman church writer named Horeo. Crowds of Gaulish students sought the Irish shores in order to win back again from their former pupils the learning that they had lost themselves. In the light which we have today, this statement is absurd. It is not the observation of casual or disinterested writer. It is evidence of a defence set up in advance, before any question arose as to Ira's primacy in learning or spiritual culture, to establish an alibi for the Roman Church and to prevent any future search for knowledge in a direction which might bring the light to the falsity of the Roman Church's claims regarding the papacy, the Saviour and the Bible and might reveal the true source, source and birthplace of Christianity. As a defence, it is insufficient, and as a support for Roman claims, it is weak in the light of the facts brought out in these pages. It is a statement made to take from Aire her preeminence as the mother of letters, learning, spiritual culture, and the original source of Christianity. It is quite true that crowds of students from Gaul, as from other countries, did go to Ireland to receive instruction, but not from their former pupils, but from the proficient master teachers who provide, presided over schools and institutions that go back to the long ages of the distant past. A German authority, Zimmer, the Irish element in medieval culture by Zimmer, Speaking of the advantages which students derived from going to Ireland for instruction, as well as of the influence which the Irish monks and teachers had on European learning and culture, 
while apparently accepting the Roman fiction as to the date of the beginning of the Irish learning, says, There they found such specimens of classical literature as Virgil's works among the ecclesiastical writings and an acquaintance with Greek authors, as well as the opportunity of free access to the very sources of Christianity. This admission is clear and proves in the light of evidence in hand that he knew that Ireland was the true source of Christianity. And the present writer has knowledge of the fact that among the enlightened Germans of today, there are those who know that the Irish were the Hebrews. Those Greek authors referred to above will probably be found to be Irish works which have been ascribed to Greece as well as were the works of Homer. Ancient Greek history is mostly fiction and her classical personages are merely mythical characters taken from Irish culture and ascribed to Greece by the obscuritans to build up a background to correspond to the glorious historic role they have assigned to her as the nursery of letters and genius. In our histories of Greece, the period in which she is said to have reached the highest point in art and which is called, for impressive reason, the Golden Age of Greece, has for its transcendent genius none other than Phidias, an Irish name for art from the Irish word Phidias, formed from Fud, art, and Aeus, man, an artist, and Deus, elegant, precise, neat, dexterous, hence Phidias, the dexterous artist. For Virgil's works being present in Ireland and, and available for the use of the foreign students, there is no doubt in the writer's mind that, like our Bible, these works are the product of ancient Irish culture or of an ancient Irish author and have been appropriated by Rome. The name Virgi belongs to the Irish and is not a Latin word name. In the various countries of the European continent, it was the custom of the Irish missionaries, philosophers and schoolmen to travel about from place to place preaching Christianity and teaching philosophy, giving instruction to individuals and groups wherever they could get a hearing or command attention. These traveling schoolmen were the true Peripatetic philosophers for an example of whom the obscuritans would call our attention to Greece. Those teachers travelled over the highways and byways of Europe with bells in their hands, ringing them to attract attention and shouting to the people, Wisdom to sell? Who wants wisdom? Wisdom to sell? Such a philosopher or teacher was called a fargil, pronounced fargil, a learned or wise man, from far, a man, and jil, meaning learned, wise. When this word is inflected, it becomes Virgil, and it is this generic Irish appellation that later Roman church writers have appropriated and claimed as their own under the form Virgil. The works which were found in Ireland and ascribed to this fictitious Virgil may well be considered a product of the ancient Irish culture. This is not only th this is not the only Irish name which the Roman priest scribes have Latinized. They have given the name Virgilius to a great Irish astronomer and scholar who established himself in Salzburg and founded a school there and has been called most learned among the learned. Another instance of where a fargil has been appropriated by Rome as a Latin is that of an Irish monk whom they have called St. Vigel, mentioned in Irish wisdom preserved in Bible and Pyramids by Conor McDarry. In the work here mentioned, it is shown by a neutral clerical witness, a Frenchman, that his St. Vigil was an Irishman and evidently a missionary of the Irish church 
whom Pope Zachary is in, in the 8th century accused of preaching a heresy in regard to the Antipodes, the earth was still flat to the Roman churchmen. In the controversy which followed, the Irish monk proved to Zachary that the Irish were habitually accustomed to have intercourse with a transatlantic people, that is, regular and consistent communication with the people on our American continent. The Roman Church, in her endeavour to blot out the history of the past ages in order to conceal a great deception, destroyed whatever she may have had of literature and, since her acquisition of the Irish Church and institutions, she has appropriated the names and works of Irish authors to enrich her reputation for learning and culture and to build up a fictitious galaxy of distinguished sons to ornament her institution. In brief, the history of Rome is largely fiction. Her genius did not lie in the direction of learning and culture. She gave more importance to the acquisition of power, wealth, luxury and the gratification of the sensual ambitions. The genius of the ancient Irish did lie in the direction of learning science and spiritual culture, and in this field they manifested such zeal and enlightened fervour, leavened with tolerance, as no other people has ever shown. This was in accordance with the concept of the sun god, whose beneficent rays shone for all and when they personified as the saviour Iesa Creost, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, and said to have been crucified on a tree shaped like a cross, the upright human body with the arms extended, for the salvation of all mankind. The precepts which they embodied in the life and acts of the saviour, they strove to emulate in their own lives and intercourse, winning men from the ways of sin and evil, and teaching them to accept the verities of true religion. The story of the Roman Church is quite different and not a pleasant one to dwell upon. She made her advance through the medium of intrigue, war, fire and sword, persecution, torture, confiscations and death. The exemplification of force and intolerance. By such means she gained control and increase of power and the Irish church missionaries were gradually forced to withdraw from the continent. It was only by such forcible means that she could make gains against the Irish church, whose representatives surpassed hers in every field of peaceful endeavour and attainments, in learning, the sciences, philosophy and spiritual culture. As to the standard and character of the attainments of those teachers, the German writer Zimmer offers his testimony. Although he has been misled by the Roman fiction that Irish learning had its beginning in the 4th century. Zimmer says, They were instructors in every known branch of science and learning of the time, possessors and bearers of a high, higher culture than was at that period to be found anywhere on the continent, and can surely claim to have been the pioneers, to have laid the cornerstone of Western culture on the continent, the rich results of, whim, German, of whom Germany shares and enjoys today, in common with all other civilized nations. Zimmer, the Irish element in medieval culture. This high quality of learning and culture has been a characteristic of the schools of IRA from ancient times and was never lost to them. And when the missionaries and teachers of the Irish church came to the continent in the beginning of the early medieval period, it was only to reintroduce and renew the instruction and learning from Rome, which, learning which Rome had suppressed and forbidden. It is absurd to claim that such an eager zeal and enthusiasm and the consequent degree of spiritual culture and learning which those missionaries displayed could have been developed in any people who had been reclaimed from ignorance and semi-barbarism at or about the beginning of the 4th or 5th century, as the Irish are said to have been by Roman and British writers. 
There is not an instance of such rapid development of any race or cult in the entire history of mankind. Such an ardent zeal for learning and spiritual culture as was developed in the monastic schools and universities of IRA and displayed by her missionaries and teachers in their proselyting work as they advanced on the continent in the wake of the retreating Roman forces from Britain to win back again the territories from which they had been driven by the armed forces of the Roman Church was the result of thousands of years of intensive effort and cultivation in their homeland until it became almost a national trait and tendency. Knowledge and learning were an inseparable part of their ethical culture since they believed as they did in the evolution of the soul as a natural colliery strove to inculcate light, knowledge and wisdom in accordance with their exemplar, the God of Light. One of their beautifully expressive and comprehensive names for the Sun God in harmony with this concept of him was Lul, pronounced Yule, hence our word Yule for the Christmas tide, meaning knowledge, art, science, judgment, a, da a guide, a mariner's compass, a way, service, attendance, and Luil, a Jew, a devotee of the day or sun worship. And genitive from this root word, we get lul lumar, meaning wise, judicious. It was from this ancient wellspring of wisdom that our Bible came, and from no other source. It was originally the product of the inspired seers and prophets of the fire or sun worship, whom we know as the great adepts in spiritual art or the Magian priesthood of Aire, hence its ancient title Inisfail, the island of wisdom. In the Bible text, they are disguised under the generic names of Hebrew from Ea, Ebrach, the priest of the fire, and the Levites from La, the day, the celibate devotees of the sun. The key by which this heretofore baffling and insoluble mystery was unlocked has been found in the most ancient cultural language on the earth, the Irish language, and cognate with this idea, there is, there is ancient Irish word which bespeaks a tradition that this was the first cultural language spoken. This word is Gair Tighirn, pronounced Gartirn, the voice, speech, or language of God. This is said to have been the language spoken by all the descendants of Adam, Adham, until the building of Meimrod, Nimrod's tower. This is the language which has given us the key to the Bible and which was developed in Aire by ancient Irish priests of the fire or sun worship. The memory of the sacerdotal order or priestly cult has been secretly preserved in the mythical story which forms a part of the early beginnings of Irish secular history. And their identity is masked under the name of Tuatha de Danann, from Tuath meaning a lord, implying the spirit, and da, god, danan from dan, meaning artist, artificer, and architect. Hence the allusion to them as the great magician cult, or the master adepts of spiritual art. Another secret distinguishing title given them and by which they are called is domnun, of ancient Ireland, meaning lords or rulers. It was under the leadership and rule of this order of priesthood that there arose in Ire the patriarchal system or order of society which we find reflected in our Bible stories. But for camouflage, the theatre of their existence has been translated by Rome from Ire in the west to Syria in the east and given an oriental setting. Ire, as Earth's most sacred shrine, had to be suppressed and the great stream of pilgrims diverted for profit 
towards the new shrine in the east, with Rome as a station on the route thither. The name Jerusalem was taken from Aire and given to the substitute shrine built up during and since the time of the Crusades. Rome had had the spoils in her possession so long with the history of Aire submerged in the bed of the ocean under the name Atlantis that she did not deem it necessary to change the name of Aire's chief shrine, Jerusalem. The root of this name word is Lar, pronounced Air, the West, and is identical with Aire, the West. It tells its own story. The word name is Jerusalem. The letter J is an interpolation and prefixed as a disguise. This substitute shrine flourishes only through being embellished with the names of Ire's mythical kings and the cryptic names evolved by her Hebrew seers and inspired priests. Ire was their homeland and they were identified with her history from the remotest times. To go back to this beginning of organized society in Ire, if it were possible, would take us back many tens of thousands of years. In this connection, at a time when ancient tradition and lore was stronger and fresher in the minds of men then living, it is worthwhile to note the opinion of Edward Spencer, the writer and poet who held an office in Ireland under the English government in the year 1596. He stated his conviction in a survey submitted to the government entitled View of the State of Ireland. He says, the Irish are one of the most ancient nations that I know of at this end of the world, and are from as mighty a race as the world ever brought forth. This opinion and acknowledgement by Spencer made at that late date is in correspondence with what has been stated in these pages as to the great heritage of the Irish people, the memory and traditions of which were yet with them in his day. Even more than two centuries later, there still survived a tradition in the Emmett family, of which the patriot Robert Emmett was a member, that Ireland would yet rule England, which may perchance have been but a prophetic idea bequeathed from an ancestor based on the axiom that history repeats itself. And today no close student of history can deny that the Irish Pope Kings anciently were the rulers of Britain. Spencer's statement serves to show that erudite men of his time knew that Ire was the great and unrivaled cultural nation of antiquity. It will be noted that Ire took no part in the wars of the Crusades, a strange thing if she belonged to the Roman Church. A nation that was able to crush the combined forces of the Roman Church designated legionnaires and their allies, the Danes, at the Battle of Clontarf in the year 1014, would not likely have held aloof from enlisting in a so-called sacred war if they were under the Roman papacy. A nation virile enough to have put an end to Danish and Norse attempts to establish their power in the West at that time, after having conquered a large part of England, would have been an ally worth having. The very absence of the Irish from the crusading forces tells the story in itself and is significant evidence that they did not belong to and were not affiliated in any way with the Roman Church at that time, 1096 to 1099 AD. Otherwise, so martial and high-spirited a people would have enlisted. The fact is, of course, that the Roman Church was an enemy and at war against the Irish Church and nation, the Church and state being practically one. This is the first time, to the writer's knowledge, that the significant fact of there being no Irish forces in the Crusades has been cemented upon. It will be interesting to observe what forged documents may be produced to con controvert this statement and account for the failure of the Irish to rally, rally to the aid of the Roman Church. 
The most obvious truth is that the Irish Pope King, who was heir to and represented the oldest spiritual sovereignty on earth, had never abdicated his papacy and leadership or acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as his superior. That this is the truth may be seen from the attitude of dignified independence maintained and sentiments expressed by Columba, an Irish monk and member of the Irish Church at the Irish Monastic Foundation at Luxuil in Gaul, in a letter written in the year 598 AD to the pretentious and domineering autocrat Pope Gregory, whom churchmen call the Great. I shall quote here from a writer who, while giving credit and praise to the Irish monks, philosophers and schoolmen for their culture, acumen and erudition, is primarily a pro-Roman advocate and seems always to try to show that the contention between the Irish and the Roman Church was merely over the question of the proper date for the celebration of Easter, that the Irish obtained their learning and spiritual culture from Roman Greece and that its beginning dates from the time of the fictitious introduction of Christianity, although he makes mention of an old and mellow civilization established by the Druids and the Bards, where was carried on the pagan culture and instruction in history, poetry and law. Inciting the opinion of Columba and the fact that the Irish considered their schools superior to those of Gaul or Italy, the writer referred to says, thus Columbanus, in one of the letters to Gregory written at Luxeal, tells the Pope that the Irish astronomers and computists held in very low esteem victorious of Aquit Aquitaine, whose cycle drawn up in 497 AD had been adopted in the Galician and other churches. For thou know, he says, writing circa 598 AD, that by our masters and the ancient and the Irish ancients, who were philosophers and most wise computants in constructing calculations, victorious was not received but held more worthy of ridicule or of excuse than as carrying authority. In this brief excerpt from his letter to the head of the Roman Church, we can discern that, that at once the Columbanus were not of the same communion or church as Gregory. In this letter he contemns the, condemns the pretensions of the Roman scientist to the head of the church which has accepted his astronomical computations as a basis on which to arrange their feast days. This is nothing short of being an insulting missive, and it is most certainly not one from a subordinate monk or prelate to the head of the Roman Church. On this point it carries its own refutation in its contents, and it is an expression of Columbus' contempt for the learning of Roman's representative in the field of mathematical computation and astronomical science. The interference, the, no, the inference to be drawn from this letter of Columbanus seems obvious, yet the writer in question seems to be laboring under a delusion, to say the least, that Columbanus belonged to the Roman Church. The veriest novice in the ethics of Roman Church discipline should hold a different opinion. In the following excerpt from his letter, Columbanus tells Gregory in unmistakable language what his status with that of others will be if he, Gregory, disregards the authority of the Irish Pope. Commenting on this letter the writer referred to says, In this letter to Gregory, as elsewhere, the extraordinary self-assurance of the Irish schoolmen, which was so long to exercise the popes and the religious world of Europe generally, breaks out thus early despite the overflowing affection and reverence manifestly cherished by the wonderful old monk for the chair of Peter. With all the consciousness of a superior culture, he tells the great Pope, who was little accustomed to counsel so imperiously given, what would be the Irish attitude if Irish opinion on Easter observance was not endorsed by him. 
For I frankly acknowledge to thee that anyone who goes against the authority of Saint Hieronymus will be repudiated as a heretic among the churches of the West, for they accommodate their faith in all respects unhesitatingly to him with regard to the divine scriptures. And he adds, And if, as I have heard from thy holy Candidus, Pope Gregory's representative travelling in Gaul, thou shouldst be disposed to say in reply, that things confirmed by ancient usage cannot be changed, error is manifestly ancient, but truth which reproves it is ever more ancient still. In this letter there, was, there is proof that the Irish did not belong to the Roman Church at that period 598 AD, as claimed by Roman writers and churchmen. Even this commentator whom we have quoted above is so biased as a Roman adherent that he endeavours seemingly to misconstrue the plain intent and import of this letter by interpreting it as an expression of overflowing affection and reverence felt by Columbanus for the chair of Peter. It was anything but that. It was a direct, unwavering and dignified condemnation of Gregory's attitude of opposition to the authority of the Irish Pope, Saint Her Hieronymus, the Latinized form of the name, from Ire, and he inf inferentially stigmatizes Gregory as a heretic, not neglecting to state that the Irish Pope was considered the true interpreter of the sacred scriptures, and justly so from ancient time and usage. The anima adversion of the writer aforementioned to the extraordinary self-assurance of the Irish schoolmen which was to exercise the popes and the religious world of Europe generally, leaves us to infer that this attitude on their part was due merely to a consciousness of a superior culture, and in the absence of an explanation, was based on vanity and conceit of learning. That such was not the case is now evident, as we know that their attitude rested upon the very best of ethical and moral grounds. The Roman papacy was a, was a usurper, and Rome's antagonism to the Irish Church antedates the First Punic War between Rome and Carthage. This latter city was an Irish Church colony and foundation, hence the opposition of Rome. The historic cause of the Punic Wars, as given out by Church historians, conceals the issue. The Easter question mentioned in this letter of Columbanus, evidently discussed in reply to previous correspondence with Gre Gregory, cannot be accepted as the real cause of dispute between the Roman and Irish churches. It is too great a strain on credulity to accept as a fact that all the wars, spoliation and bloodshed instigated by Rome against the Irish church and which reacted against her in the overthrow of the empire, were caused by a quibble over a feast day of Irish origin at that. <laughs>